founders of NAVCOM Technology, where he is a senior research engineer. He has previously worked at Magnavos John, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Boeing, as well as a few years as a consultant. His work emphasis is on high accuracy applications of GPS, global positioning satellites. He has authored and co-authored over 40 papers on navigation uh, topics and 20 papers on relativity topics. He, uh, he has obtained 25 patents as an inventor or co-inventor. Except for two, all of these patents relate to GPS. Ron received his BS in math and physics in 1962 from Seattle Pacific College. He has served the Institute of Navigation as president and as chair of the satellite division. He was in uh, the 1994 recipient of the Satellite Division Kepler Award for sustained and significant contributions to satellite navigation. He has also received the, the Thurlow Award and is a fellow of the Institute of Navigation. It's great pleasure to have and bring to the podium uh, a, a longtime member of the MPA and uh, he's going to talk about uh, GPS and uh, uh, believe it or not, maybe relativity isn't uh, being used the way we th think it is. So everyone give a warm welcome to Ron Hatch. Let me uh, turn it up. We can use a little more. Cool. He'll adjust the game. Okay. In any case, um, I'm glad to see all of you here, uh, especially some uh, friends and coworkers, and <laughs> even uh, my daughter. So, uh, let's. With that, let's get started. Uh, I want to talk about using GPS to refute the equivalence principle. And just in case you're not aware, the equivalence principle is what the general relativity theory is based upon. And uh, as you'll see, it has implications to the special theory as well. So with that, uh, let's go. I thought a few quotes here would be uh, well, would be nice. Uh, it skipped a slide. Well, that's OK. Interesting. Maybe it's gone. It's gone. That's it. I wanted to show that you can actually simplify Einstein without using <laughs> But I'm going to use a few equations. I have put a few of, uh, of uh, Sheldon Harris's slides uh, in my presentation at various spots. Okay. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, those quotes, which was, is it, does it switch the slides a little bit? Uh, I'll go a few ahead and you tell okay. me. That was In three. any case, let's, yeah. no, no, There's, let's go ahead with the outline. Okay. I'm going to talk first about the equivalence principle a bit and, and falling electromagnetic radiation. <coughs> uh, in the typical book explaining uh, the equivalence, they use frequency and they use falling uh, electromagnetic radiation in a gravity field and in a rocket. I'm going to argue that that doesn't work in the gravity field. And then uh, when I have done that in a paper, I got a refutation from a prominent uh, relativist who said it doesn't need to fall, that in the accelerating rocket acts just like the, uh, like the gravity field. And so then I had to write another paper to refute <laughs> that because he didn't want me to answer him back. So, so I wrote another paper for that. Uh, with that, let's go on. Is this the next one? Uh, there's the quotes. Again, uh, we're a different order, but let's look at some of them. The tendency of a group of human beings to quickly come to believe something that its individual members will later see as obviously false is truly amazing. <laughs> uh, a couple more uh, in, uh, in Lee Smolin's Trouble with Physics. It's controversy that keeps science alive and keeps it moving. Uh, Richard Feynman was quoted by Lee as science is the organized skepticism in the reliability of expert opinion, which is good. I like the last one. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It is the glory of kings to search out a matter. A lot of you, I know, are trying to search out matters, if you will. Let's go on. Okay, another little uh, cartoon. He says, if only he could think in abstract terms. He's got two apples over three pears, etc. <laughs> we're going to deal with the equivalence principle, and we're first going to look at it, the definition of it, 
Uh, then we're going to look at its impact on frequency, which is what they normally use to prove it. We're going to talk about GPS and how it refutes it, and then I'm going to give you what I think is a rather illogical quote from a GPS expert. Okay. The equivalence principle defined uh, was defined in these two places by Einstein and by Feynman. Uh, the assumption of the complete physical equivalence, which is the strong equivalence principle, it's called, of the system of coordinates k with gravitational field and k prime uniformly accelerated, we call the principle equivalence. This intimately connected with the law of equality between inert and gravitational mass, weak. I think before I'm through, I'm going to argue that both parts of those, the strong and the weak, are both false. Uh, Feynman said much the same thing in six not-so-easy pieces. Uh, strictly uniform gravitational field and a strictly uniform acceleration. Okay, next. Um, again, we're missing a slide, but we'll uh, probably see, see it see uh, next. After? So let's, yeah, here That's we go. It? Okay. Uh, first of all, the gravitational, I think there is fundamental confusion in what you read. They often talk about uh, gravitational acceleration and, and its effect, well, it turns out gravitational potential uh, is what causes frequency change and not gravitational acceleration. Similarly, velocity is what causes a frequency change with motion, not acceleration, okay? The implication is that because a gravitational field reveals a frequency difference between two clocks separated in height, and Pound and Repka ex did an experiment that proved that with a Mossbauer effect, which some of you saw earlier in, in a, a presentation earlier. Uh, two clocks separated in the along acceleration axis of an accelerating rocket must also see a frequency difference. Uh, this was claimed true in a real recent article uh, that I cite just because uh, it was real recent and uh, showed the same confusion. Einstein says that frequency increases as the electromagnetic radiation falls, and Feynman says the same thing. Uh, I want to show that that doesn't happen. Okay? And here we are. Again, let's go to a different slide. We're back up. Uh, that's going forward. Let's go back, back one. up. Back one. Back another back one. Another one. And well, it's, it's missing it, and we'll go ahead. There's a Clifford, uh, a slide with Clifford Will that I wanted to there, show. Okay, that's there it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was the one logically next. Uh, he claimed, he, he I, I've criticized him extensively in my papers, but at least he had the gumption to ask the question. Does the frequency change in transit, or is it the clock rate which changes the function of the gravitational potential? And he says there's no way to tell the difference, that they're equivalent. He then goes on to say, well, we can take a clock, and we can atomic clock that's based on how the frequency of the, of the radiation uh, of an atom, and we can take it to a higher gravitational potential, and we can see what happens. And in fact, what happens is when it's higher, it runs faster. But, but, but he says you still don't know what happens in real time. And that's kind of rather uh, weak logic, in my opinion. Uh, let's see what let's go on. Our next, uh, the critical assumption. Well, sorry. yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the to the other slide. Um, yeah, that one. This one. That's the one. Uh, they the, the proof that both Einstein and Feynman go through is to say that if we have an atom at uh, at floor level, and we carry it up to a second floor or something and then we let it emit an atom, we put energy into the process as we carry it up, and therefore when we emit the atom back down, it's going to have more energy uh, when it falls, so it's got to increase in frequency to show that increase in, e in energy. That's their argument. Um, and it seems on the face of it, E1 minus E0 being the photon energy, and uh, the energy E0 over C squared GH being the amount of, of extra energy they had to put in to carry the atom up. So let's go to the next slide again if we can find it. Yeah, here we go. Oh, was it that? Yeah, that's the one. The same amount of energy is required to emit, you know, the assumption that they made is it's the same amount of energy is required to emit the radiation at each gravitational potential. 
I say that's not obviously true.